Welcome to Our Sport. I'm Larry, I'm your host. John, as always, doing the recording and editing and providing occasional commentary. The Super Bowl set is going to be the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. We're going to cover that game uh, with a full preview in our next episode. We're going to start this week by talking about some of the new coaching hires in college football, and we're going to start with Mike Leach. Mike Leach at Mississippi State left Washington State in the Pac-12 to join the SEC, and he's going to bring his air raid system to this conference. This this was actually in play in a conference before. He was an assistant under Hal Mummy of Kentucky. This was 25 years ago or so. God, it might have been 30 years ago at this point. And so the conference has seen it, and the passing games have evolved. You, you can't torture defenses like those Hal Mummy teams did, where they made Tim Couch and one pick in the draft. But Mike Leach is still very much an innovator with this sort of passing game. Um, he's going to give teams a lot of problems. He has a quarterback to work with, Garrett Schrader, a talented player. One of the more talented players he's ever had. And he's going to be a rising sophomore. He's also got some receiver talent. He's He makes all his players better at those positions just by um, the way his system works. But when you have actual talent, that's going to be a, a step up from what he's had before where he's just kind of found guys, made do. He'll, he's found like Garner Minshew kind of off the scrap heap. He evaluated him well. But... He's had a series of fifth-year seniors at Texas Tech. He just plugged in one after another after another. Guys who just bided their time, and some of them would end up leading the nation in passing. Now, I don't think he could win the SEC. I don't think he could ever win the SEC. And that's fine. It's Mississippi State. But here's what he can do, and he's done this before at Texas Tech. He can pull some big upsets. Be, the way Mississippi State is, and maybe under Joe Moorhead, um, probably even under Dan Mullen, they could not really pull the big upsets. Mullen beat LSU that one year with Dak Prescott. But Mike Leach could go 8-4, and four, but he could have a win over both Alabama and LSU while he's doing it. He's a dangerous coach, and he, he can do for that program what was not been able to do. As for taking to another level, you know, maybe you kind of do that when you pull some of these upsets. Maybe you're viewed differently. I will say this about Leach. He's got a very, very eccentric personality. And he's kind of, uh, he kind of indulges in it. It's, he, he knows how he's perceived. And I think he's, he's kind of maybe even goes a little overboard with it. He likes to hear himself talk. He's a smart man. He's got a law degree from Pepperdine. Now, if you look over there, what's happening at Ole Miss. Ole Miss is Lane Kiffin. And that boy loves himself some attention. And I predict that... I don't know, even before the spring games start, these two are going to start sniping at each other. They know better. They know how to work the media to get attention for their teams. And they're going to start going back and forth. And it's going to be very intriguing as a rivalry um, off the field and off the field. This is already a bitter, bitter rivalry. These programs hate each other. These fans hate each other. Um, Ole Miss blames Mississippi State for putting them on probation and are probably right. And Stephen Godfrey compared it to crabs in a bucket. You know, I may not get out of here, but you won't either. I'm going to pull you down with me. Mike Leach, Mississippi State, we're, we're all the better for it. This one's going to be a fun one, something to watch. Baylor's hired Dave Aranda, the former LSU defensive coordinator. Aranda was a longtime assistant, defensive coordinator at Wisconsin, defensive coordinator at LSU, and very, very well thought of by other coaches. They had a lot of respect for him. Uh, the LSU defense, in terms of its normal talent, was down a little bit this year and had some, some bumps. But you saw against Oklahoma, um, he, he and other teams, he kind of made do. He Against Georgia in a champion, uh, SEC championship game, he kind of figured out what he had as a defense and kind of worked to his strengths. And, of course, you know the offense being the way it was helped him out. Aranda is known as uh, an intellectual, a cerebral uh, kind of coach. That's, that word comes up a lot with him. Um, but he's a tough guy. When he's a high school player, he played a playoff game um, with a broken collarbone. So you're talking about a guy that understands the toughness of football. Aranda's already got some work in. He's got a forced offensive lineman to decommit from Michigan and go to Baylor. And this is a good fit culturally. Uh, he speaks a lot about his faith. Baylor is kind of steeped uh, in their faith as an institution. Um, Matt Rule, the former coach, his dad was a Baptist minister. And you wonder before, how did, how did a guy from the Northeast, from New York, fit in well? Well, that, you know, that kind of background helped him uh, kind of get in that culture and be very comfortable with it. And I think Aranda is going to have similar success 
in that way. Just first coaching job as a head coach. Uh, usually you want to make your mistakes somewhere like Bowling Green, not like Baylor. But he has held out for jobs. He has had a lot of offers before this, and he held out for what was a really good fit. And I like this hire uh, for the Baylor Bears. At San Diego State, head coach Rocky Long stepped down. Long was a long-time uh, fixture in the Mountain West Conference, a former New Mexico alum, and then became coach of New Mexico. They let him go. Um, was an assistant at San Diego State under head coach Brady Hoke. Brady Hoke actually turned them into a pretty good program. They were a two-win team for a long time. He got them um, to winning records two years in a row. Hoke leaves for Michigan. They put Long in. They promote him for defensive coordinator. They want to uh, have stability inside the program. Worked out beautifully. And he had some really successful seasons there. He was almost the architect of that 3-3-5 defense, and that thing was an option killer. He made his bones playing option teams, even back to Mount, the, um, to New Mexico uh, when you play Air Force. And, boy, his defenses were awesome at that. And produced some great players, Rashad Penny, DeMonte KZ, and had really good success there. Now, what do you do? How do you place him? Speaking of Brady Hoke. Brady Hoke was his defensive line coach at San Diego State. He brought him in, and now he's head coach at San Diego State again. I will say this. The Boosters liked Hoke. Before, when he was going to Michigan, the Boosters were actually, so what Boosters there are, were trying to put out a package to, to financially keep him at the institution. And you can't turn out of Michigan for San Diego State, obviously. But they have a new on-campus stadium soon, and Brady Hoke had success there. If you look, you wonder if Michigan's almost cursed because people have a lot of success other places and go to Michigan and fail. Hoke took Ball State to a 12-0 record and lost in a MAC, a MAC championship game, but still got them there. He was conference coach of the year. When he's at San Diego State before, conference coach of the year. When he went to Michigan his first year, conference coach of the year. It did not end well his last couple of years, but not a complete disaster as a coach. I like this hire for San Diego State, especially because of the familiarity that Hoke has with the program and what he needs to do there. And there is talent in that San Diego area. You look historically, some of the players that came out of there, uh, Terrell Davis, uh, we're talking about his high school players, Ricky Williams. Ricky Williams from Texas, not from Texas Tech. Uh, Alex Smith and Reggie Bush, they were in the same backfield in high school. They were on the same team. And this is all local talent in San Diego. So uh, I kind of like this hire. I, th I think it's a good fit for them. So another quirky personality has a job. Washington State opens up because Leach leaves. And the Cougars are bringing in Nick Rolovich, who is the Hawaii head coach. Rolovich was a former Hawaii quarterback, an alum, went there and coached them to a pretty good amount of success, success by their standards. Um, Always achieved more than that team was supposed to. That team was supposed to win four games. He'd win eight and pulled surprises. They, he did not like the way they were going, and all of a sudden, he just went back to the run-and-shoot offense. It's something he was, uh, uh, when he was a player, he was in the run-and-shoot under June Jones and brought it back. So you think that this is kind of a seamless transmission to what Washington State played under Leach. Washington State was doing something very similar. You wouldn't quite say it's the run-and-shoot. The run-and-shoot's a little different. Um, than what Mike Leach was doing, but not far enough off where you could have maybe a seamless transition um, into this offense. I really like this hire. Rolovich has a, a really kind of tongue-in-cheek personality. He had a, a beef with Oregon State when he tried to recruit some of his players, and he put out some funny Twitter moments on there, which I'm not going to repeat on this channel in case kids are listening. <laughs> but, um, it was it was pretty good. And the guy is just fun. The guy is just hilarious, man. When you watch him, his, uh, he was mad at his team one time because of the effort they gave in the game. They were getting blown out. And he just had him pull the, the benches off the sideline. He goes, make them stand. And also, one of the things nobody really talks about, but I noticed that he did, was he went on the road and won games. Now, you go on the road and win games to some teams, it doesn't matter. When you're on the road and you win games in Hawaii, it's difficult because they were always, always terrible when they got away from the islands, had to travel two, three time zones in their conference. And not only did he win games, but he won games by big margins. So the dude can't coach. This is a great hire for Washington State, and this made the conference a lot more fun. Um, as of this recording, Hawaii has not announced their head coach. We're going to cover that when they eventually do. 
All right, I don't know how many of you guys were here a couple weeks ago, more than a couple weeks, a couple months ago, but we had a segment with just us two where I kind of took over and I asked you about some people, teams, just things that you thought were overrated or underrated in the NFL and college. Okay, I didn't know what the segment was about. He just said, I got a segment. This will be one of those things where I made a mistake and you got to just put it on display? No. No. You sure? This is, yes, All yes. Right. This is as we start to move into the draft season. We're going to talk about different players, draft stock, and sometimes we have some opinions on players. Sometimes we find guys. Sometimes there are guys that are rated highly that we don't think are good. Uh, so I'm going to go back into the past, talk about players that you thought differently from the general population, whether you were right or wrong. Oh, right. And, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about what like, you saw. I like that a lot better. Okay. And what you what you thought, why you thought what you thought. Okay. All right. The first player you thought was overrated. Right. Was Judevian Clowney, number one pick. Uh, right. Seven years ago, something like that, and you didn't think he deserved that. No, I did not. Okay. This is. He's been paying attention. He's talking about things like before the channel even started. We'll sit around because I love the draft as much as the league and. I'll be like, I like this guy, don't like this guy. All right, Clowney was almost certainly going to go with the number one overall pick. And I thought he was a good player. I thought he's an NFL player. But there are questions about his effort and his consistency. And it seemed like they're just, this, in this industry, they don't want to criticize players. Uh, the, the people that are most prominently in front of the television, I guess they don't want to get their reputation because people will stop interviewing with them. But people made excuses for why this guy had three sacks in his last year in college. And I said he had three sacks because he took the year off. And I don't know how the number one pa uh, pass rusher, the person with the number one overall draft pick as a pass rusher, can have three sacks. And they made all these excuses like, he's double covered. He's got more guys on him. He's got a bunch of attention on him. Well, Aaron Donald, that guy got attention all the time. Terrell Suggs had 24. i got to stop that. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you again. run by now. Yeah, okay. Terrell Suggs, as a junior, had 24. Four sacks, twenty-four. Still, I think it's still the NCAA record. You think after his nineteenth sack, people weren't like we should double this guy? He didn't come into the year with no sacks either. He came in as a good pass rusher and still got a ton of attention and managed twenty-four sacks. How's Terrell Suggs' career been? He's been pretty good. Nobody will question his effort. Yeah, you know he's got some off-field incidents, but it comes to effort. It's not a question. I I'm gonna say this: Clowney's been pretty good, and I thought he'd be pretty good. He's got a lot of natural talent. He does have stiffness. Somewhat, but he has been playing with better effort than I thought. He has size, he has speed, and this is kind of like where I thought he'd be. He's his production, his career has been what you want from a late first round player, and that's kind of where I thought he should be drafted as late first round. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're probably right about that. Okay. Now we're gonna move to somebody that you probably were not right about. This okay. is someone who you thought was overrated, went pretty high. Please don't say Pat Mahomes. No, Pat Mahomes, okay, here's the thing about Pat Mahomes. I was wrong Mahomes. about that one. Pat Mahomes, everyone had him as a third rounder. A lot of people did, except for the actual NFL teams. NFL teams had him, like, first round where very, he went. Very late riser. But, right. but a lot right. of people did not have him like that. So right. you kind of did agree with the general population there in the fact that you thought he was a third rounder, and a lot of other people did right. as well. So I didn't count that one. I'm talking about Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley has been very good this year, picked up over 1,000 rush yards. Uh, he was drafted really high by the New York Giants, and uh, you didn't really like him that much coming out of college? Uh, no, I mean, I liked him, first of all, his character. I liked him as a person. I thought he was a good kid and smart, articulate, likable. was really going to represent a franchise well. Um, but you look at his combine measurements, he just blew the combine up. Just unbelievable. Well, you know who else did? Mike Isecki, Penn State. Same college. A lot of these guys from Penn State come over there and they blow the combine up. And they're just athletes. All right? So, um, I mean, Mike Isecki's done almost nothing until a couple of late games here with the Dolphins. Yeah. And when you come from that same program, somebody there knows how to completely maximize that player's physical abilities. Whether they do that on a field, you have to talk to James Franklin because, you know. Um, but if you looked at his at his games, he had some great games. He had some games where he just destroyed teams. Well, you should. You're going to be the number two pick overall in the draft. You're a 230-pound back with 4.38 speed or whatever it was. Yeah. But he had a lot of games where he was held in check and a lot of games where he's dancing in the backfield and it's like one-yard gain, three-yard gain, one-yard gain, 70-yard run. 
And you know, I don't want that from running back. I want a guy who's going to get yards over and over again. J.K. Dobbins is not going to be the physical specimen that Barkley is. But that style, I like that style more where you got to get six yards every time you need him. Because the most important thing for a back, the most important thing is the four, besides protection maybe so you don't get the quarterback killed, is he's got to be useful in that four-minute drill. When you have the lead, we have a four-point lead, and it's late in the game, and you have to run the ball, and it's first and ten. He can't dance and try to break a 70-yarder. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. He's got to get a four- to five-yard gain. He's got to keep the chains moving and keep the clock running. And he's got tons of highlights. And he does this in a league still, though. Mm -hmm. He'll have games where he's held in check, held in check, and he'll break a long run. And you look at a stat line, like, oh, my God, he's got 22 rushes, 130 yards. And that's fine when you can break the 70-yarder. Because there are times he's going to have 22 rushes, he's going to have 38 yards. He's had these games already in the league. So, uh, but he has been really good. He yeah, has he, been. He's had a lot more to 130 yarders than the 38 yarders. I got to admit that he's been. Uh, he's been. It's his style, but he's been really productive. Yeah, yeah. And a passing game, uh, what so a nightmare. Consistency against even heavy boxes, so that you can, you know, be right. sure that you're going to get. That's what the run game is. The run game that. Advantage of it over the pass game is consistent yardage. It's consistently, it's right. not as high risk. All right. right. Uh, this is a guy that you thought was underrated. Even though he went in the first round, you've already mentioned his name. Aaron Donald loved him. went like number 13 overall. He loved fell him. in love with him. I he thought him. he should be like the number two overall pick, and you're probably right. He's been uh, arguably the best defensive player in the league. Him and Khalil Mack, best pass rushers uh, of this generation. And he's dominated so far. Right. Well, and I think he's won Defensive Player of the Year twice. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm right. Okay. Um, first of all, Donald is not a fit for every scheme. You can't play man over defense. But if you put him in the right defense, which is as an under tackle and in a 4-3, and a penetrating 4-3 where he can use his quickness, um, the guy's about 6'1". He's about 285 pounds. He's light by defensive tackle standards. But he is so quick. He is so quick off the snap. You could be outweighed if the guy cannot get the offensive lineman cannot get his hands on you clean. His hand technique was awesome. He was so advanced as a technician with his hands and productive. He had all these abilities uh, in terms of what he could use. His arsenal of moves had a, a very I love this guy. I love him so much. Yeah. A varied array of pass moves, but not only got defensive tackles, got sacks, got sacks every year at Pitt, and just was every time you watched the game, the guy was just taking over a game and. You know, he did go in the first round. He went 13th overall. I think, yeah. But that, that draft, I was like, this guy's maybe the best player in this draft. He's so good. And, um, yeah, I was super high on him. Yeah, and he's, yeah. In that, he's in the right system right now. He's supposed to be playing a system where um, you don't want him to two-gap. You don't want him to sit there and hold the guard up, have a little fight with him, and wait for the runner back to come to see which way he's supposed to go. You want him to get by the offensive lineman. Yeah. And how many times have we seen plays where the dude has been double-teamed and shoots the gap in between there? He's just... His first step is so quick. He's, oh, I have to say this. This goes partly to his use of hands. Um, he's a student of the game. You have to you have to be a student of the game to be good at your hands. You put a lot of work in, a lot of film study. He's also known for that. He knows his opponents. He knows the tendencies. He knows when to use his moves. The dude is just a complete football player and has stayed durable. Yeah. Despite being small for his position. Yeah. Yeah. He's, not, he's trying not to get into a fist fight with your offensive line. So with two gapping, right? You know, standing people up in the run game. Right. You, you want them to use his quickness, right? You want them to use his acceleration to get downhill by guys. You want, you you want, want the one shoot. gap. You want, you want the one to gap. Shoot gaps. Right. Okay. right. One gap. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, this is another guy that you were most definitely right about. And you've bragged about this before. How you never watched this person play a snap. Right. You know how I'm gonna say? Darius Leonard. Darius Leonard. Yeah. You never watched him play in college. Right. He said he was, he was really good. He went like right. second round to the Colts. He's played great. Uh, we got him in fantasy on our fantasy football team, and he's been great for us there. Yeah. Uh, how do you read a scouting report or you know, just hear statistics and think, that guy's going to translate to the NFL? Okay, well, I will say this. I've been wrong tons of times. A lot of people are wrong. But you know, you take the best general manager in the league, and they're going to be – I'm not saying I'm, – I'm, I'm definitely not the best general manager in the league. Um, but everybody is raw. The, the hit rate is – if you're hitting at 50%, you're doing great. Okay, so I was right about this particular player. Here's what I like about Leonard. First of all, he's got a body built for the NFL. He's got uh, about he's about six two two thirty, but he has really long arms. Length is a factor. Um, you want to be able to you know 
if you have to get in a fist fight with somebody, you want to keep them at arm's length. Um, he's got good speed and reactions. And he's right. I did not see him play a single play in college. I read a scouting report. Same with Cooper Cup. Same with Cooper Cup. Same with Cooper Cup. Did not, I just, you know, we drafted him our Dynasty League too. And, but I like the production. Production is a factor because some stats are inflated. He had 19 tackles in a game against Clemson. Leonard played at South Carolina State. He wanted to go to Clemson. I believe he couldn't get in for academics. And that's, that's as big as it gets when you're playing against the Clemson Tigers. 19 tackles. Then he goes to the Senior Bowl. Now you're not playing at South Carolina State. You don't have this kind of three-hour, one-game reference that uh, just could be an anomaly. Now you're at the Senior Bowl, and you're practicing against player after player after player who are going to go in the NFL. Some of the best players are – Zach Martin's been in this game, and Aaron Donald, and – um, and he did well. And then he went to the game with the Senior Bowl, and he played well. So I liked his production. is a big part of it for me. Prototype uh, NFL size. And for linebacker, ability to read and react. Yeah. So as a little team, the question is always, you know, talent. Who are you going up against? Right. Because, you know, there are great players playing at Miami of Ohio – and they're just not good in the NFL because they're not playing against great players. Because they're so playing they against Bowling Green or so playing Akron. Right. Seeing him play in big games against the competition that he's going to be facing right. was like a, a big factor. Yeah, there. because that's – talk about the, the – I don't even know what conference South Carolina State is in. Um, they might be playing probably Furman. But the jump – man, the jump from seeing the Furman offensive line to the Clemson offensive line, are you kidding me? And that offense? going to be a huge jump. Now, of course, they got slaughtered, but it's a team game. But 19 tackles against Clemson – that one thing, sometimes one thing in a scouting report, you get to your attention, and you want to investigate the rest of the player, and that's what did it for me. All right, all right. This is the last guy, a guy that you were probably wrong about. He doesn't have enough time in the league okay. for us to definitively say for sure, but he's had a great, great rookie season. Um, a guy that you didn't like coming out of college, a very a late riser, a blew up the combine, DK Metcalf. Out of Ole Miss, right? You you didn't like him. There were actually a fair amount of people who didn't like him. Right. Uh, it, he was very divisive. But some people really liked him. People really didn't. But you definitely didn't like him. You think he was not going to translate to the NFL. Nope. And he went like third round, which you thought I was think late second. Late second, right. which you thought was too high right. for where he was. Uh, so what did you see there? Okay. Well, the guy is an absolute physical freak. The guy's uh, I mean I believe six three two twenty eight. And he ran like a four three three at the combine. Just yeah. and here's the thing. One of the things I talked to John about about the draft. Uh, you'll see announcers during a college game. This player runs a four four. He runs a four four forty. Okay, those guys are rare. The announcer has to say that because he wants people to tune into the game and wants to keep your interest. And then we watch the combine. And I said, now watch how many dudes run a four four. And it's about five guys a year that can run that or better. So here's, and they're usually like the Philip Dorsett's in the world. Oh, tiny little guys. They <laughs> yeah. look like me. John Ross, you know, yeah. who's about John's size. So here comes Metcalf at 6'3", 228. That yes. picture, the, I'm going to put the picture up on the Swole screen. Miss. Donkey Kong, yeah. Swole Miss, yeah. And he's next to A.J. Brown, who's rocked up, and he looks, A.J. Brown looks like a midget next to him. Um, so here he comes, and he's massive. I mean, he's got like 4% body fat, and he just blows the combine up, and he runs a 4 3 just an absolute physical freak. Okay. That dude should have had 106 catches for 1,800 yards and 19 touchdowns. And I don't remember what his production was, but it was something like 30 catches for 400 yards and three touchdowns. Injuries were a factor, but he had never had production. So if you are this enormously physically talented, you are one of the most physically talented players in the NFL. In the NFL, you are one of the more physically talented players. You're much more than that in college, even in the best conference of college football in the SEC. All right, so why are you not destroying teams? Where's your production? All right, now I will say this. You look at some players, Daniel Hunter, the defensive end from the Vikings, was like this. He's defensive end at LSU. I think he got 1.5 sacks a senior year. And he went to the NFL, and he got a hold of a great coach, Mike Zimmer. That dude developed him. That guy knows how to develop defensive linemen. So my point is that the higher level you go in, coach, in, uh, in football, like where the professionals are, that's where the world's best coaches are. And they have all the time in the world to work with you. You don't have school. You don't have exams. That is your job, and you can develop. But the guy had so much natural talent. Why was he not destroying teams other than injuries? Also, got injured. I think he had like a broken neck. And so you want to see a guy that big kind of be durable and be an animal out there and just killing people like Derrick Henry, <laughs> who um, 
you can hit him in the face with a sledgehammer, Derek Henry, you're going to break the sledgehammer. I mean, that guy's yeah. like a monster. But why is he hurt? Why is he not productive? Plenty of guys would like to see the NFL. Size, speed, marbles, who do not turn out to be good players. Oh, and the most important thing, I'm sorry, stiff. Stiff. In that three-cone drill, it was one of the worst ever for his position. I believe it was worse than Tom Brady's. But the Seahawks did the right thing, which is like, all right, let's not use them on a bunch of routes that are, yeah, let's just use this. So what he's talking about is like hip fluidity, right. right? Your ability to change direction side to side, which is much, much different than going forward in a straight line speed. There are right. plenty of guys who are very good running straight, but can't change that direction, right. like DK Metcalf and vice versa, actually. But there are many positions that that is very important for and some positions that are not as important. Like for corner, it is the most important for you to have that hip fluidity because you're starting facing the wrong direction because the receiver's going that way Correct. and your back is that direction. So you're backpedaling and then you have to completely turn around while not losing speed. So that, that ability to change your direction and be able to flip your hips is vastly important at corner. But as a wide receiver... We found, right, we found out through DK Metcalf, basically, right. that it's not as important to have that because, again, he ran worse than Tom Brady, who's notoriously slow, yeah. uh, but he's going the right way, right? You're, as a wide receiver, you're starting facing this direction, and so he can, you know, kind of build up speed. And, and it's now it's going to limit your route tree. There's some routes you're not going to be able to run. But, you know, the guy is 6'4", and, or 6'3", 238, and he's got that body. You, know, you put him on a slant. One step and cut in and then box the defender out. Good luck tackling him. And he's fast enough to go on a go route. And there are routes that he can run like this. Yeah. Go route is, again, just straight. So it's like you don't need to turn around. Right, just but the, even like uh, uh, like the curl where you come and turn around completely, he'd yeah. probably not be good at that. But he's big enough. Because you got to turn around twice. He's got to. you got to turn around, catch yeah, the ball. you got to turn around, around and go upfield. Catch the ball, turn around. Right. But he's big enough. Where even if he turns around slow, he might be able to box out the corner anyway. The corner might yeah. be able to not do anything about it, even if he knows what's coming. You know. Now I'll also say this too, um, Jadavian Clowney. We got a pretty good idea what he is. Once he stopped being hurt, we saw what he is. Then I'm not. I'm not saying you're wrong. That I, that I was wrong about him. But this is his first year in the league. Let's wait. A lot of guys. That's come what out. I said in the beginning. That we we don't know is. But he has looked good. And I, and I, but for yeah. his first year, right. he's looked great. You want a project? Look up Michael Clayton for the Buccaneers. Look him up and see what he did his first year when he's in the league. He was a first-round pick with the Buccaneers. I believe he set rookie records at receiver. You don't even know who I'm talking about. No. Rookie records at receiver. Look what he did after that. Did almost nothing. Fell off a cliff. So, and uh, I'm not trying to justify what I was saying. I, I could be completely wrong. I like to know that I'm wrong because uh, you, you learn then. Why was I wrong? I could look back and say, well, what about him did I not get right? And that's what this segment's all about. That's what it's all about. Okay. Got that one? No, no, that was the last one. That was the last one. Unless you want to talk about one more, because, like you said, I'll talk about know. one more. I didn't know this was coming. It's fine. I'll talk about the guy I was absolutely the most wrong on was Pat Mahomes, and there's enough sample size and enough dominant play that this was this was the <laughs> unless one. he dies in a car crash, he's gonna go down as he's, one of the greatest. And uh, I believe in our dynasty league, somebody drafted him, and I was laughing about it. Oh yeah, like a dumbass. And, <laughs> and okay, what you have to understand is that. Players in this system in college, this air raid system, there have been a lot of players who had similar numbers to Pat Mahomes. He had awesome numbers in college just um, because that system throws the ball all the time and pads your stats. And then he's not sitting out games in the fourth quarter because they're in Texas Tech. Uh, they don't have a defense, so he has to play to try to keep them in a the game. So his stats are more inflated because RG3 the Alabama— RG3 was a good example of that because he threw right. it. He threw for the thousands and thousands of yards. But, but look at look at Tua's stats because he's sitting by the second quarter. So his stats are not inflated. And at Texas Tech, you're a 6-6 six and six team. You're in every game. you got to play till the fourth quarter, and you're throwing all the time. And so tons of quarterbacks went there and had 5,000-yard seasons year after year after year. Now, <laughs> also, Hi, that's it. And you're playing Big 12 defenses, which are trash. They're straight trash. I'm sorry. Good job in a playoff, Oklahoma. Good job. I know it's Joe Burrow, but I mean, have a pulse. <laughs> Georgia defense played way more ramp. Um, but you're also playing against pretty trash defenses in that conference. A very Sometimes you won't have a pass rusher drafted in the first round or second round from the whole conference. That's what you're going against. Okay, but the dude made a ton of highlight plays. He they described that as Sandlot football, like he needed refinement. Um, he would make plays outside the pocket. We've been playing outside the pocket because he's great, and he's making plays in the NFL 
awesome plays because he's great, and I was dead wrong. I could not have been and wrong. he completely maximized himself. Uh, he went First of all, sat out uh, a year, right. which helps you tremendously no matter how great you are. Right. A lot of great quarterbacks do that. Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes. It helps you adjust to the league. The league, you go from, you know, how many players are in college football? Like 12,000 12, 12, to 1,600. Right. It's a different league. Those guys are faster. They're bigger. They're better. There are throws you can make in college that you can't in the NFL because that safety's three steps faster than he is in college. Right. And it takes adjusting a lot of times to be able to catch yourself up, and it takes learning. And a lot of guys can't do that, right? Like Vince Young. Vince Young can never adapt to the speed of the NFL game. Uh, but it helps you to sit behind a great quarterback and learn, right? A guy who's already experienced, like Alex Smith, a guy who knows what he's doing, even the routine guys. So you can adjust to that. And then he went to a offensive mastermind. Andy Reid is a quarterback whisperer. He schemes guys open all the time. He has an incredible weapon in Tyreek Hill deep. He has an incredible outlet in Travis Kelsey who gets right. open every play, and he completely maximized himself. Right. Yeah. And I, I will say this. When when I scout a player and I break him down, I do all strengths and weaknesses. Even if I hate the guy, I don't like Mahomes because of the system and the defenses, but I said, okay, why? what could he have going for him? And I, I did say that when he got to the Chiefs, I'm like, you know what? Um, there, I'm not. I'm believe. I'm not excused. I was wrong about Pat Mahomes. <laughs> Hear me. I was really wrong about Pat Mahomes. But I did say if there's any chance he has to succeed, it's with this coach, Andy Reid. That man would develop quarterbacks. He made AJ Feely a lot of money. I mean, you remember? You know AJ Feely? Who? Right. Yeah. And um, but that dude is a multimillionaire because of Andy Reid, and he got in the best possible situation. Sad a year. Andy Reid was coaching him. And regardless of all that, that dude would have been great. It's obvious he would have been. He he could have gone to the Bengals and been great. And okay, let's let's not get crazy now. Well, we're gonna have that theory now. We're gonna have that theory tested because the Bengals are maybe the worst running organization in the NFL. We're gonna get into that when we do Joe Burrow. Let's talk about the draft. The East West Shrine game happened over the weekend. This is the game that's the little brother to the Senior Bowl in terms of players that show up there. Uh, if you do well there, you can get an invitation to Senior Bowl. Same with the NFLPA game. This year, the scouts said that even by this game standards, there's not as much talent as there normally is. The player who helped himself the most, James Morgan, Florida international quarterback. Big kid, 6'4", 220, prototype size, three-year starter. And did not have the kind of senior year that he wanted. Uh, but practiced well here and played well in the game. He's going to be probably a late third round pick, maybe early fourth. And Morgan is kind of in that area between possible starter or definite developmental kind of player, maybe just a long term career backup. But he intrigued people, and his blend of size and experience is going to be a lot uh, appealing to a lot of scouts. The competition that he played against and his subpar performance as a senior, relatively speaking, is what's going to hurt him the most. Kevin Dotson, guard from Louisiana, was here. He fared up and down, but would really have some problems with Bravion Roy. Bravion Roy is a nose tackle from Baylor, a little bit of a sloppy body, and this is the player who gave him the most fits. Um, he's going to see more players like that in the league. Roy's considered a late draftable player, if that. Also here, Lavert Hill from Michigan. Michigan State's Raycon Williams, defensive tackle. And North Carolina's offensive tackle, Charlie Heck. Heck is a nasty player, about 6'7", about 3'10". And Heck is the kind of player that goes past the whistle. Has to be controlled a little bit by the coach. Um, has some ability, and but needs some discipline. Will get personal fouls. And I watch a Georgia Tech game where he punched the guy right in front of the ref. So <laughs> you got to control that a little bit. Uh, Benjamin Victor, Ohio State, big player, came from a loaded Ohio State receiving uh, core, uh, 6'4", 200 pounds, had some hiccups, a few drops, but really performed well during the week, also a big winner. When the Senior Bowl comes around, which is going to be this week, you're going to have a much higher quality of player there. Um, we're going to be covering that. We love the draft. And uh, are we going to have a recap of who won? Basically, you're not looking at the game there. You're not looking at the games here. You, you can watch it if you want, and that's a factor, but you really want to look at the practices. Um, Al Davis, Raiders uh, 
former owner, used to believe a lot in the game itself. And you could go by that because I remember Darius Leonard had a monster game in the Senior Bowl after he had a monster career um, at South Carolina State. And he turned out to be a steal of a draft pick. But the practices are what the scouts look at. And a lot of times by the game, they're already gone that day. So that's what we follow. And, and uh, we're going to have a recap of the Senior Bowl in our next episode. Hi, it's me again. Um, if you like this episode, don't forget to hit like down below. If you want to see more content from us, there's a subscribe button down there with the bell. If you click that, ding, every time we upload and you'll be able to know. Usually we upload every Sunday. Our next episode is going to be the Super Bowl preview. We're going to have the Senior Bowl review when that happens. And we're going to have tons more content. If you have your own suggestions, in the comments section, you can put it down below, whether it be team, player, coach, whatever it is, we'll be sure to cover it. And if you want to have more ways to come in contact with us, there's some stuff down in the description box. We have a Facebook, Twitter, email, we're everywhere. And as always, thank you for watching. Adrian Peterson.